Well, it's 10 o'clock on Sunday evening here in the Philippines at the training center in Santa Maria. And Nita and I had a busy week in Davao and just got back here about five this afternoon. And we're ready to begin our study. And um, it's, uh, I guess it's 9 a.m. Central Standard, Central Daylight Time in the Western Hemisphere. And so it's time for our to our time to gather around the table of God's word and spend some time continuing our study in the book of Romans. Uh, as I begin uh, this evening, uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, we will have a uh, communicator seminar this week, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We're expecting probably 25 to 30 uh, to gather here for those three days as we continue our monthly uh, study. Uh, generally, most of the men have been studying with me and um, and new people uh, have come. Um, still, a lot of people are not able to get here. But anyway, we'll have that. Uh, be in prayer for, for safe travels for all of them as they come from all over the island and um, for the funds to provide for food and so on for them. And... Um, We'll praise the Lord for that as, as that time comes. Um, let's see. Oh, one other thing. I When I first started this, st this teaching here 26 years ago, um, most, of the, most of the students who came did not have Bibles. And so I got into the habit of printing all of my lessons, as I, as I do now when I send them out to all of you uh, online, to have the notes in your hands. And since they didn't have their own Bible to turn from page to page, I provided the passages as I still do in the notes and so on. But I'm realizing now that many of you probably do have your Bibles uh, open with you as we study. And you may want to turn to the passages of scripture that I'm quoting in my notes. Uh, to see them for yourself in your Bibles, and I highly suggest that you do that. So I'm going to have to try change my my speed with which I'm teaching and give people time, those people who are uh, using their Bibles and are opening their Bibles and turning to the passages that I reference in the notes, to give them time to get to those passages before we move on in the in the teaching. So I'm going to try, it'll be uh, an adjustment for me, to slow down some as we move from, from passage to passage. And as I pull up passages uh, to, to stress a point or pull up a passage to make some points, I'm going to try uh, slow down and give a little bit more time uh, for those people who are, in fact, uh, paging through their Bibles uh, to keep up. So uh, with that, I trust you've all prepared your hearts for the study of God's word this evening or uh, this morning, as the case may be. And so let's open with a brief word of prayer, and we'll pick up with a brief review of where we were in Romans chapter 3. Let's pray. Father, again, you've given us life today, and we've chosen to spend this time, the next 75 minutes, of feeding on your word allowing the teacher, the indwelling Holy Spirit, for those of us who are truly born-again Christians, allowing the Spirit to be our teacher and to teach us the truths that you would have us learn. Only the Spirit knows uh, the level of our spiritual growth, uh, which basically determines our ability to understand Scripture. Uh, as we start out as babies, we understand very little. And so the Holy Spirit has to begin to to spoon feed us little by little. And as we learn more, we're able to understand more. And so we leave all that to the Holy Spirit. He's the one that knows how and what you're capable, each listener is capable of understanding. All I can do as the mouthpiece is to share the word. And so we'll leave that in, in the Spirit's hands, Father, and we'll continue in our, in our feeding on your word for your honor and for your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, um, let me pick up here with my notes. And I've got the recording started, so we're good to go. In chapter one of Romans, the book of Romans, Paul addressed the 
immoral man in that chapter. Then in chapter two, he addressed the moral man, the man who thinks he lives a moral life, thinks he's doing good, um, thinks he's fulfilling all the boxes that say I'm a moral man. Then we come to chapter three. And so far in chapter three, Paul is now addressing the religious man, the man who not only thinks he's moral, but he also thinks he's he's religiously moral. And so we were in the midst of that study and we got to, to verse 23 when Paul comes to the grand conclusion, a verse we all know, one of the first verses we memorize, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so in verse 22, we ended with, for there is no distinction. That was verse 22, which both, both look back to the ones who believed and ahead to the universal need for justification. So verse 22 ended, there is no distinction. In this one verse, we have man's worst and man's best, all in the same verse. Man's worst and man's best described. The worst part of man is that he is a sinner. One who sins, and the Greek word for that is hemartano, meaning missing the mark. The best part of man is that even in his doing good, he falls short of the glory of God. And falls short is the word pusterioonte, ontai, the third person, plural, middle indicative, passive middle indicative of the verb hysterio. It's in the middle voice, so it means it is man's benefit to fall short because he, falling short, is now helpless, but he's not hopeless. He must depend upon God. The glory is the word doxa and looks at that which is spoken well of. So even when man does, even what man does by way of good deeds, falls short. The present tense of doxa, or the present tense of falling short, I should say, means they keep on falling short. Or it's inferior, it's either inferior or deficient when compared to the glory of God. When used of God, the word glory looks at that which is revealed in his character and his perfection. As we read in Exodus 33, 18 to 19, then Moses said, I pray thee, Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 and 19, where we read, then Moses said, I pray thee, show me thy glory. And he, God said to Moses, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion to whom I will show compassion. Thus, man's need is established by sin and the fulfillment of the need is taken out of the ability of man by his inferior good works. Man cannot save himself. That's what we call religion. Man, by man's efforts, attempting to solve man's problems or attempting to gain God's approval, whichever one you want to say it. Man, by man's efforts, attempting to gain God's approval or man, by man's efforts, attempting to solve man's problem. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did in the garden. When they, when they realized what they had done in disobedience to God, they recognized that they were sinful. And the first thing they noticed, hey, we're naked. We better cover ourselves. We better cover that effect of that sin. And what did they do? They went and cut leaves for themselves to cover themselves with their leaves. Man, by man's efforts, trying to 
solve man's problems. They just don't work. Man's solutions are never good enough. Justification of self is so impossible for every member of the human race that we could liken it to, to all of us lining up on the Sasa Wharf, I said last week, or lining up at Corpus Christi in Southern Texas and here trying to jump from the Sasa Wharf to Samal Island or trying to jump across the Gulf of Mexico to Florida. We'd all jump and we all might go different distances into the water, but we never would make it. We would all fall short. Some may get farther out into the water than others, but all, everyone would fall short. So that then brings us to Romans 3.24, which is the verse we had uh, just been working on as we finished uh, last week. So let's pick up with 324, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Two very, very important terms we find here in verse 24, justified and redemption. And so the first thing we looked at last week as we draw near, the, near to the end was the Greek concepts, three Greek concepts of this word redemption we find in scripture. The first Greek word is agorazo. And agorazo means to purchase something in the marketplace as a slave in the marketplace, which is what they were doing, but not removed. Purchased, but not removed. Paid for, in other words, need a, we went to the, the open market this morning in Davao before we came home. And Nita walked through the marketplace. And, and I know in many of the places she makes arrangements with the various people selling their goods, but she'll walk around through and so not have to carry all of them from place to place to place. She'll make arrangements for her purchases, pick them up and bring them back to a spot. And then when I she calls me when she's ready, I went to pick her up. And that's when remove we she paid for those things, and at that point we removed them from the marketplace. So agorazo simply means the payment was made. We'll get to the removal in a moment. So it means to purchase something in the marketplace as a slave in the marketplace, but not yet removed. Emphasis on the price being freely paid, and on the fact that Christ died for the entire human race. So that's that's what. That's the price that paid for you and I to get out of the slave market, the death of Christ. He paid that penalty. But this word agorazo focuses on emphasizing the price being paid and on the fact that Christ died for the entire human race. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, but false prophets also arose among the people just as they will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought, there's that word, agorazo, the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Then we come to the next word, ex-agorazo, ex -agorazo. that means purchased and removed. Purchased and removed, from the slave market. This word looks at being redeemed from one thing to another. And that is from the law to Christ. From the law to Christ. Galatians 3.13. Let me, let me check something here in just a moment. Um, I think I may need to... Uh, yeah, I've got someone here that are uh, got an open mic, just a moment. Okay, let's see, we've got that one. Let's see if we've got another one here somewhere. Oh, I think we're good, okay. All right, excuse me for the, for the interruption for a moment. Just again, just a reminder folks, I know on some of your phones and when you, 
when you log in on your phone, uh, you may not understand just exactly how to uh, turn your microphone off on the cell phone. So uh, remind yourself, learn about it or whatever, because uh, it becomes a hindrance if someone's microphone is open and uh, we can hear what's going on in the background. So thank you, folks. Excuse me for the interruption. From the law to grace, there's there's the redemption and the removal. We were we were slave in the slave market of sin under law. And the moment Christ paid the price, he paid the price so that we could move from law to Christ. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed, there's that word exagorazo, redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Then we come to uh, three words, three different forms of the word that talks about the paying of the ransom, who is ransomed, and ransoming, the act of ransoming. So let's look at them. First, we have Lutroo. Lutroo is, and for some reason, my, there we go. Lutroo means to release by paying a ransom. To release by paying a ransom. First Peter 1.18, knowing that you were not redeemed, there's that word Lutroo, translated redeemed. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. So there we see the word redeemed, Greek word latroo, and it speaks of a release by paying a ransom. Then we have the word lutron, which means a ransom. It speaks directly about a ransom. Matthew 20, 28 is a passage where we find that word. It reads in Matthew 20, Verse 28, Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom, there's the word lutron, a ransom for many. And the third word, dealing specifically with the term ransom, is lutrosis. Lutrosis is translated a ransoming, the act of ransoming. Hebrews 9, 12 is the verse we want to look at there. The book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 12, for this word lutrosis. Hebrews 9, 12 says, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, that's his spiritual death. Remember that, my friends. Whenever you see this word blood related to what Christ did on the cross, his work on the cross, whatever, that word blood is not his, his literal blood in his body. All right. And this is a this is a good verse, a good verse to to stress this. All right. For a long time I studied, and let's let's make a comparison. All right. Let's make a comparison. When the goats and the calves and the bulls, whatever, were brought to the altar for sacrifice, those goats and calves came to the altar alive. They were placed on the altar alive. Their, their artery was cut and they died by bleeding to death. Death came upon them by the bleeding, the blood of their bodies flowed out of their bodies, and as a result, they died bleeding to death. Christ on the cross did not die by bleeding to death. He did not bleed to death. Oh, he did a lot of bleeding, a lot of bleeding while he was while he was whipped and, and abused and so on and so forth. 
No doubt there was blood, but none of that blood from his body paid for sins. It was all part of the process, but that wasn't when sin was paid for. When they put the crown of thorns on his head, there would have been some blood from those crowns, from those thorns, but that's not the, the blood that paid for our sins. No doubt when they nailed his hands and, and his feet to the cross, there was blood, blood from his body. But that's not the blood that paid for our sins. All right. And someone might say, well, all of those make up for the payment for our sins. No, no. The life that Jesus gave was not, had nothing to do with the literal blood in his body. The life that he gave and the life that died in him on the cross was his three hour period of separation from God the Father and God the, God the Holy Spirit. That three hour separation happened at 12 noon when the very first sin of all mankind fell on the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that moment, for the very first time from eternity past, the second person of the Godhead was separated from the first and third persons of the Godhead, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. That, my friends, is when our sin was being paid for. He was separated because he had become sin for you and I. And for that three-hour period of time, that is when our sin was being paid for, right? And then after the final sin was paid for, he was still physically alive because he spoke, tetelestai, it is finished, paid in full. So the sin debt for all mankind had been paid. Jesus was still physically alive and he had become spiritually alive once again. His spiritual relationship with the Father and, and the Holy Spirit was renewed because the next words after he said it is finished was, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So he was still speaking, still physically alive when he spoke those words. And after speaking those words, then he died physically. He gave up his breath of life. And it was after he, after all that, after his spiritual death, he came back to spiritual life. Our sin had been paid in full, 100%. And then what happened later? The Roman soldiers went out. They, the, the, the Jews came and asked if they could take Jesus' body off the cross. And so they sent the soldiers out to make sure that the two thieves and Jesus himself were truly dead. And they broke the legs of the two thieves that were still alive because once they broke the legs, they could no longer have the strength to, to lift themselves up and get another breath of air. So basically, once they broke their legs, they, they died of suffocation. They're, they couldn't hold their, their skeleton up and it was cutting off the air passage in their throat and they died of suffoc suffocation. But when the soldier came to Jesus, about to, to break his legs, he thought, well, he's already dead. No sense in breaking the legs. So fulfilling the prophecy, they didn't, not a bone in his body was broken. But what did the Roman soldier do? He stabbed him in the side with a spear and what came out? Water and blood. There are people who really think that that's what the meaning of we're washed in the blood, washed in the blood. We take a bath in the blood that came out of his side? No. Sin had already been paid for when he said, it is finished. It is finished. So the blood, every time you see that word blood, you remind yourself, interpret that word to mean his spiritual death on the cross. So Hebrews 9, 12, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, that's his spiritual death. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And there's our word, lutrosis, a ransoming. 
all three of these words, lutroo, lutron, and lutrosis, all have to do with the means by which we are bought, taken out, and then set free. Emphasis is on the recipient of the redemption, you and I as believers, our position in Christ as a free agent. So let's look again at Romans 3.24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption. We're looking again at that word redemption. And now the word we find here in verse 24, redemption, is the word apolutrosis, which is in Christ Jesus. So in verse 24, we have this word apolutrosis. By adding the prefix apo, the emphasis now is that of a release affected by payment of the ransom. So payment of ransom has been made, so that calls for a release. We are set free because the ransom has been paid. The emphasis on the ransom being paid by Christ. That's the, en the, the emphasis. The ransom being paid by Christ. We were held captive in sin, but the wages of sin, death, were paid by Christ. He died, died spiritually. That's the death we're talking about here. Died spiritually to pay the penalty for sin, the wages of sin, is spiritual death, separation from God. And he experienced that separation for three hours. So in the next verse, we are told of the ransom price. The redemption can be found in only one person, in Christ Jesus. The redemption was a result of grace, and brings about the gift of, and here's the second important word in our passages, justification. When, what justification is and is not. Let's, let's learn just what does that word justification really mean. Justification is a legal term. And it looks at the pronouncement of a verdict. Having heard all the evidence, a verdict is pronounced. God declares the believing sinner righteous on the single condition of faith in his son. No works, nothing you can do to be righteous in God's eyes, but by faith alone in the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross, God declares that unbeliever to be a believer, to be righteous on that one single condition, faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Justification is the declaration of a verdict, not the infusion of a quality. It is, it is the declaration of a verdict. It has nothing to do with any quality whatsoever. Justification is not forgiveness. Justification is not forgiveness. It is more than forgiveness. While forgiveness is a part of it. In other words, forgiveness results from the fact that God sees us justified. And therefore can forgive us. But it's not all of it. For example, a child may throw a rock through a window. And admitting wrong, he may be forgiven but he is still guilty. So what happens? Justification removes the guilt. Justification removes the guilt. Here's something else. Justification is not a pardon. It is more than a pardon. A pardon covers sins of the past. No judge anywhere has ever issued a pardon for future crimes. Justification in God's eyes is, however, that kind of a pardon. Not only a pardon for past sins, but a 
pardon for future sins. Justification deals with the sins of the past, present, and the future. That means it's more than just a pardon. Justification is not a change in character. You won't see a change in the character of the person as a result of justification. Justification is only a change in position. Men and women who have been justified by faith remain sinners. Sanctification, another big word we've studied in the past, is the process of dealing with changing the believer into an experiential image of Christ. The moment we are justified, God sees us in Christ. But, but we're not like Christ experientially. Sanctification is that process of changing the believer into an experiential image of Jesus Christ. Justification provides a new position, not a new person. Our new position is in Christ. And the moment you become a born-again believer, you are a baby as to your understanding. And within moments after your salvation, the evidence that you're still a sinner will be real. You'll sin again, but you're still justified in God's eyes. And so what's happened? The moment you were justified, the moment you had faith, you took on a new position out of Adam and into Christ. But you were still that same person. Before you were a lost person. After justification, you're now a saved person, but you're the same person. You still think the same. You still do the same because you don't have information to live as an experientially justified, sanctified person. Justification is not a return to innocence. Justification is not just as if I'd never sinned. I've heard so many preachers, so many Bible teachers explain, well, that's really what justification means. Instead of explaining truly what it means in comparison to all the other things that happened to us the moment we got saved, they just say, well, it means just as if I'd never sinned. That's not justification. Justification is a state of righteousness, not innocence. It's not as though we'd never sinned. If we'd never sinned, Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross. So we are not innocent. God sees us righteous, but we are not innocent. The fact that we have sinned and fallen so short is the basis for the greatness of what God has done in justification. Justification does not build a holy and righteous character in the believer. That holy and righteous character is the process of sanctification. Romans 3 deals with justification. When we jump ahead two more chapters to Romans 5, that is where we will deal with sanctification. So, let's pick up now with Romans 3, 25. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Whom God displayed, whom, speaking of Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. There again, his spiritual death, blood, spiritual death, blood, spiritual death through faith this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of god he god passed over the sins previously committed god is the one who is offended by our sins and thus he alone is the one who must be propitiated the word propitiate means satisfaction and through the ransom paid, we looked at, at, at redemption and the idea of ransom and those words we looked at. 
the ransom paid to the Father by Christ at the cross. The word sanctification. This word propitiation, I should say. This word propitiation means God is satisfied with what Jesus Christ, with the ransom paid to the Father by Christ at the cross. The Father's righteous demands were met. The cost, the spiritual death of Christ, called the blood of Christ, the spiritual death of Christ is the meaning of this phrase, the blood of Christ. And this phrase, blood of Christ, in Colossians 1.20, refers to the sum total. Here we talk about the, the sum total of all that took place, of the violent deaths, two deaths, spiritual death for the payment of our sins, experienced by Christ on the cross. And of course, followed that by his physical death, followed by his burial, followed by his resurrection. We read in Colossians 1.20, Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, and through him, through Christ, to reconcile all things to himself, God the Father, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Here we have Christ being put on the cross at the third hour, according to Mark 15, 25. That's about 9 a.m. in the morning. And on that cross, I believe, at that time, that the physical body of Jesus was there and the supernatural power of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, there are two aspects we speak of regarding the Holy Spirit. One is the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and it's permanent. And I believe that the, the Jesus Christ, the, the egg, the conception in Mary was was taken out taken care of by the holy spirit i believe at that moment that process in the womb of mary was was permanently indwelt with the holy spirit and i believe that all during jesus life as a human being he was permanently indwelt with the holy spirit i think that's why when he was age 12 Every time his parents went to the went to the the uh, synagogue or or to the temple, and they uh, he heard them in their prayers or whatever, he understood because he had the permanent dwelling of the Holy Spirit to teach him the meaning of all that they talked about in their religion, and so he was very brilliant and and astounded all the all the teachers in the temple at age twelve. Because he had the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I believe throughout his entire life, until he reached age 30, he did not have any supernatural ability whatsoever. Neither do we. We're permanently indwelt with the Holy Spirit, but we have no supernatural ability that comes with that. And I don't think he did either. But when he reached age 30 and went to the river to be baptized by John, that is when I believe, as he came out of the waters, and that was required, his baptism there was required by Jewish law. Jewish law said when a, when a young man reached the age 30, he would begin his ministry, whatever it might be, priesthood, uh, whatever. And so at age 30, he needed to be, according to Jewish law, washed, cleansed, baptized. And when he came out of the water, God the Father spoke from heaven, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came and flew down and lit upon him. I believe that is the moment 
that the supernatural power of the filling with the Holy Spirit occurred in his life. And so for the next three and a half years, all the miracles, everything he did, the Holy Spirit was using his body to do those things. Of course, to the people observing, they saw that it was Jesus doing those things. But when in fact, it was really the supernatural power of the filling with the Holy Spirit. Now, when he hung on that cross, for those first three hours, I believe the Holy Spirit gave him the supernatural power to bear that pain that he was suffering in his physical body. He suffered physically. He had been suffering physically in the hours before they put him on the cross. And in that suffering, he spoke the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I believe he, I believe he said that to, to keep from, from becoming upset in his thinking. And we are to forgive people that do something to us. If we, if we hold on to resentment, if we hold on to anger, we're the ones that suffer. It becomes a sin in us. And so we need to forgive. And I believe that that's, that's what he was stating. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, that doesn't mean that they became believers. That doesn't mean, mean that they were forgiven for all their sin and would one day be in the kingdom. No, not at all. I believe that that prayer was more for, for his peace of mind than for them to, to uh, not be disciplined or or cursed by God, whatever. Then at 12 noon, darkness fell over all the earth as the first sin of all humanity fell on the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians 5, 21. He, God the Father, made him God the Son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteous of God in him. And that was, that darkness lasted for three hours while God the Father was judging the sin. And in that three hour period of time, he screamed, my God, my God, to the Father and to the Holy Spirit, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, the answer to that, of course, is he had become sin. And God the Father and God the Holy Spirit had to turn from him. And that meant he, Jesus, hanging on that cross, who was actually the God-man, the second person of Godhead, was now spiritually separated from the first and third persons of the Godhead. That is the meaning of the blood of Christ. His spiritual death. Life is in the blood. And what life did he give? His spiritual life died. For that three hour period of time. But once all the sin was gone. As God was judging all that sin. And the sin was all gone. He said. Tetelestai. John 19.30. It is finished. Meaning paid in full. And then he prayed. Father into thy hands. I commit my spirit. And he bowed his head. And gave up his breath. And died physically. The word blood is a metonymy. Metonymy is a figure of speech in which a noun is used to describe a larger event or a whole event. An English example might be, I was reading Shakespeare the other evening. Well, what was I doing? Was well, Shakespeare standing in front of me and I was, I was reading him or reading his mind? Or no. What it means is I was reading something that Shakespeare had written. All right. Or someone say, well, he wrote a bad hand. What does that mean? He wrote a bad hand. Was his, was his hand crippled or was his hand bad? No. What it meant was the grammar that was used, the style or the, the form when he wrote was very poor. Now, the use of the word blood then should remind the reader of the total violence of 
the cross, not just the litter of blood that flowed from his tree, is, is, is from his body. All right. But the entire total violence from the very time they 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 hit him, from the very time they, they whipped him, that whole thing is what should be in our understanding when we talk about the blood of Christ. We are saved by the finished work of Christ on the cross. That is his spiritual death. That's what saved us. Now, he went through all of that, but the spiritual death is what really paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. And when that payment had been made, he said, John 19, 30, it is finished. The Greek tetelestai, which actually means paid in full. After the volitionally, he volitionally gave up his spirit. After he said, it is finished. He then said, Father, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. Okay. The spirit there, I believe, remember the word pneuma can mean a human spirit. It can mean breath or wind. It can also mean the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that use of the word spirit in this passage, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He was giving back the breath of life that God had given him 33 and a half years earlier. When he came out of, the, out of Mary's womb, and for the very first time, like every human baby, for the very first time, their, their lungs took in air outside of their mother's womb. And I believe that's the point at which, that's the, that's the breath of life that God gives that infant as that infant comes out of mama's womb. That very first breath, the breath of life. And I believe that Jesus in saying, into thy hands I commit my spirit and my breath. You gave it to me 33 and a half years ago. I now would give it back to you. And in doing so, he died physically. Okay. Then we read in John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And I believe there it means his breath of life. The two deaths of Jesus Christ are mentioned in the plural use of the word death in Colossians 1.18, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. In Colossians 1.18, we read, he is also head of the body of the church. Body here is the spiritual body of Christ. This is one of the, one of the 14 times where we find the word ecclesia, meaning the spiritual body of Christ. Translated church. Remember I've said before, taught before, that ecclesia appears 122 times in the New Testament. And in only 14 times, it's interpreted, the translated as the word church. In 103, 114 of those times, I guess it is. 122, I guess, 117. 117 times, but only 14 times does it really mean the spiritual body of Christ. And here's one of those 14 times. He is also head of the body. He, Jesus Christ, is also head of the body, that is the spiritual body of Christ, the church. And he, Jesus Christ, is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He was the first resurrected so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. And then in Isaiah 53, turn back into the Old Testament and Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. Isaiah 53, verse 9 reads, His grace, or his grave, was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man, in his death, 
because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Our salvation is related to the spiritual death of Christ. That's his three-hour separation from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. That's the basis for our salvation. While our future resurrection is related to the physical death of Christ. He had to die physically so that he and we could be resurrected with him. So our salvation is related to the spiritual death of Christ. Our future, if you're listening to me now, it's still in the future. Resurrection is related to the physical death of Christ. The death of Christ upon the cross demonstrated God's righteousness. The deaths of Christ on the cross. In the Old Testament economy, God passed over sins. There was an atonement then. They covered their sins by sprinkling the blood over the Ark of the Covenant. So in the Old Testament economy, God passed over sins. There was an atonement, a covering, but not a taking away of the sins. So when John the Baptist saw Christ and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that's, that's something that never took place with the lambs that they sacrificed, the Jews sacrificed at the temple day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. That blood was taken in with the high priest and sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant to cover the sins of Israel. But here, John the Baptist is announcing, behold, the lamb, not a lamb from your family, but the lamb of God, who doesn't hide away, doesn't cover the sins, but takes away the sins of the world. Not just the one Jew who's doing the the sacrifice for their sin. Not just the sins that the high priest goes in for the sins of Israel. No, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of every human being who will ever live in the entire world. So when John the Baptist said that, he introduced something so new that it was unknown in the Old Testament. The taking away of sins, not merely the covering up of sins as on the Ark of the Covenant, but the taking away once and for all of all sins. Verse 26. Moving on for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In the past, the perfect righteousness of God was demonstrated in his covering of the sins of his people. But now, his righteousness is demonstrated in that he is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In justification, God's great character is demonstrated in that he was able to save us and make us a part of his family. With that, let's turn for a few points regarding the doctrine of justification. First, the source. The source of justification is God the Father. He is the highest of all the courts and all the judges, and he is ruled by his supreme power that we are righteous. Now, who can overturn his ruling? No one. The nature of justification is that it is a free gift. Free gift. You can't work for it. It's a free gift. The word used in verse 24, durian. Now for you Filipinos, that's not durian. It's durian. And it means a gift. And it indicates that which is without payment and totally undeserved. In John 15, 25, this word is used in a negative way. Jesus said, they hated me without 
cause. In John 15, 25, John chapter 15, verse 25. Verse 25 of John 15, we read, but they have done this in order that the word may be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And me, and me, son, may durion, durion. Not durion, durion. There was nothing in Jesus that deserved hatred. And there is nothing in us that deserves salvation. The source, the nature, the principle of justification is grace. Grace is the single principle by which God bestows blessing on man. Grace is unaffected by the merit and demerit of the object of blessing. God saves apart from any merit or demerit on our part. The base of justification is the cross. The cross was the place where the full demands of God were met. Sin with its guilt and penalty was poured out upon Christ who said yes to every sin of every member of the human race. Yes, I'll pay for that sin. Yes, I'll pay for that one too. The issue then is faith in Christ and what he did. Faith in Christ and what he did. The condition or justific of justification, the condition of justification, the only condition is faith. Nothing else. Faith. Then we come to Romans 3. 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith. Apart from works of the law. Justified by faith. Apart from works of the law. Next we have the agent of justification. Is the Holy Spirit. At salvation is the Holy Spirit who applies Justification to us. 1 Corinthians 6 11. First letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you, Paul writes, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit. Of our God. So the Father initiates justification, the Son executes justification, and the Holy Spirit applies justification to the believing sinner. The position of justification is union with Christ. And again, we've read it before in one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5 21. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin. He, God the Father, made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And we come to Romans 3, verses 27 and 28. We read 28 just a moment ago. We'll read it again as we study through it. Verse 27, where then is boasting, Paul writes, it is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. And then verse 28 again, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. The result of understanding justification is that it should humble us. Boasting Calchesis looks more at self-congratulation rather than bragging. Boy, self-congratulation. Let's just congratulate ourselves because we do such a good job. huh? But there is no room to congratulate ourselves when we are justified by God. That's one thing when we do a good job and get a good grade in school. Uh, that's fine. But there is no room 
to congratulate ourselves when we are justified by God. Excluded here is the word eglilio, and it's aorist tense verb and conveys three concepts. One, it has a summarizing force. That means it is the bottom line. Summarizing. This is the bottom line. It is a de decisive force. It means right now, right now. Don't wait. Decide now. Right now. Third, it is a final force. This is once and for all. Then they ask the question, but what kind of law? The question is asked. What kind of law excludes boasting? And someone says, well, is it a law of work? No. A law of works would lead to boasting. A law of works would lead to bragamonies. I, bragamonies, I think, every time I see that word, I think, well, let's just, let's just pass around in this meeting. Let's just pass this microphone around, and you tell me, tell us all what God has done in your life today. And someone has some great story and then pass the mic around. Well, by the time you get to the second or third one, the stories have gotten so big, you gotta, you got to come up with some bigger bragamony. Or to emphasize self. That's what I that's what I see about these passing around the microphone and talk about ourselves. What kind of law excludes boasting? A law of work? No. A law of works would lead to boasting, to bragamonies, to emphasis on self. Only by the law of faith is boasting excluded. And then we come to Romans 3. 29 to 31, he writes, or is God the God of Jews only? Now he's summarizing. Now remember chapter one, he hit on the, the immoral man. Chapter two, he hit on the moral man. Now here in chapter three, you know, uh, and we've talked earlier as we've studied here as as he was talking about the immoral man or the Jews. Now remember, there were Jews. He was writing to the church in Rome, which had both Jews and Gentiles as they were reading this letter. And so as they're reading through this, the Jews are sitting there watching this, what, what Paul says God's going to do to the, to the unbeliever, to the immoral man. And he gets to the, the moral man. They were still nodding, nodding, nodding. Now he comes to the religious man. Now he's nailing down the Jews because they were proud of their religion. They were religious people. But they were practicing all these things they, thinking they could, like religion, man by man's efforts, trying to prove God's, earn God's approval, all right? By solving man's problems, it doesn't work. So with all that, he now comes down to his final verses in chapter 3, 29 to 31. And he says, Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith, circumcised referencing the Jews, and the uncircumcised through faith, uncircumcised meaning the non-Jews, the Gentiles, through faith is one. God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Verse 31, do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Paul has said a lot about the law. And now it may appear that the law was useless. But may it never be. The law brings awareness of the need and the necessity for redemption and justification. So the law was there. God was put that law in place to remind those people, remind us that we can never, ever, ever be good enough. The law points that out to us. 
we will never be good enough. And that should make us aware of the need and the necessity for redemption and justification. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up Romans chapter four, and we'll just kind of begin that a little bit, and uh, then we'll come back to that uh, next week. Um, let's do that. Let's see here what I've. Okay, all right. Okay, let me. All right, Romans chapter four. Let me clean this up on the screen. So let's have a look at. I better get it over on my notes here, too. Here we go. So, Romans chapter 4, an introduction. Paul has presented the doctrine of justification. We've just finished Romans 3, 19 to 31. As he continues to address the religious Jews of Rome, he uses an illustration of justification that predates the Old Testament law. He presents the case of Abraham. Abraham is used... in the epistles as an example of our life of faith. Abraham was the physical father of Israel by procreation. Abraham is the spiritual father of all of us by way of faith. As he was justified by faith, so are we. As he was sanctified in his spiritual walk by faith and by faith decisions, so are we. As he anticipated by faith his ultimate glorification, so do we. So let's begin with Romans 4, verses 1 to 4. Uh, I tag that as justification, salvation by faith. Reading in Romans 4, verses 1, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God, and it, that belief, that faith, was reckoned to him, Abraham, as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews as well. Book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 of Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, that is faith, the men of old gained approval. Now, Hebrews 11, of course, we know is uh, the verse of, of faith. We call it the faith chapter in Romans because he because he Paul lists all the different um, Old Testament heroes who live by faith and what they accomplished and so on and so forth. So this in Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, this is sanctification of the believer. And then we move to 11, verse 8. Down to verse 8, here in Hebrews 11, just move down to verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. Abraham was sanctified, set apart by faith decisions and by faith obedience. Then we move on to 9 and 10 of Hebrews 11. Glorification. He looked ahead to eternity by faith. Reading in 9 and 10 of Hebrews 11. By faith, he, Abraham, lived as an alien in the land of promise, 
as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which had foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham is one of the key figures in the scriptures, being mentioned 285 times with over 70 references in the New Testament. So let's look at verse 1 in detail of Romans 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? Paul, now continuing his Socratic style, asks a question. What should we say or conclude when we consider Abraham? According to the flesh, refers to Abraham while it applies literally to the Jews who claim Abraham as their father. Paul is simply using the phrase to refer to Abraham while physically alive. So he says, has found. The word has found in your, is Eurisco. And it's a perfect active infinitive, which means to find something. A result, a conclusion found by Abraham as a result of what God did in justifying him. Verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Our works, our deeds, do establish in the mind of others our character. Our deeds validate our mental attitude and our words. So from human viewpoint, there is a form of justification or a declaration of human righteousness from man as a result of our works. If that was all that mattered, what others thought of him, then there would be a cause for boasting before men. But in verse 3, he goes on, for what does the scripture say? And it says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Well, we also have that same words in Genesis 15, 6, as Paul was quoting that passage. Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he reckoned to him, reckoned to him as righteousness. It is the Bible that is the absolute final authority and the absolute criterion in this matter not rationalism, nor empiricism. Not what appears to be right before man, but what is declared to be right before God. Paul emphasized the scriptures because then, as now, man, especially religious man, had added to the Old Testament not only their own interpretations of the law, but additional laws. They had taken the law that was designed to show the total inability of man to justify himself before God and turned it into a system or systems of works for righteousness. So they, and we today, are reminded of just how Abraham was reckoned with or imputed with perfect righteousness. And so we have a simple equation. He believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we see it so often. He, God the Father, made him God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteous of God in him. To believe God is not only to believe that he exists, to believe God is to believe also what God has said. And so we're down to just under a minute. And I want to turn to Genesis and read how Abraham questioned God. So we'll do that uh, next week when we get together. And with that, let me just close out with a, a brief word of prayer. And I've just uh, let me make a few comments before we close in prayer. Um, I don't remember. I don't know if it's five or six years ago, somewhere Ever since we've had the training center in 2011, 
uh, we've needed so that Nita and I could would be able to travel and we'd be free to, to teach here at the training center or wherever we were invited to teach. And we've been invited to, to teach throughout throughout the nation. Actually, we've been all the way up north and and in, in the, all different regions of the Philippines, we've had an opportunity in these 26 years. And so in that, we've had to have, once the training center was built and we have a garden and, and we have animals and so on, uh, we've needed uh, we've needed a caretaker. And so for a long time, uh, we would invite our uh, nephews. We've had a, a, a brother one time who came uh, for a while and a couple of nephews have tried for a while. And But a few years ago, five or six years ago, uh, Ray came to us. He was uh, one of the students in the in the training center. And um, he we asked him if he would come and do some work for us. And so he built some beds upstairs and so on. Well, he's been he's been our caretaker for the last, I think, five five years, if I remember correctly. And about that time, or even before that time, um, most of the expenses of operation of the training center has fallen on on whatever God has provided for Nita and I in whatever form. But we'd never had anything specific, uh, specifically for the training center and and to pay wages for Ray or the electric bill or whatever. If we had a class, of course, we had funds for that. But if we didn't have a class in session, uh, we still had to take care of the animals. We still had to take care of the garden. We still had to uh, take care of maintenance and the training center and so on. So Dr. Patel several years ago uh, was sending uh, he just decided if he had the money, he'd send it and trust the Lord to to provide it at some time. So we've been receiving five hundred dollars a month uh, for the last four to five years, I would say, that Dr. Jim has been sending. And of course, in his passing, uh, that hasn't uh, continued. So I just pray that uh, pray with us that the Lord has someone to replace Ray. Ray is leaving us, so we have to find a new caretaker. Um, but keep all that in, in prayer for us, uh, not only to find a new caretaker, but for funds to be provided uh, for his wages and, and so on and so forth. So we'll leave that with you in prayer and we'll close in prayer. Father, thank you again uh, for this time in your word. I just, I'm so excited when, when we as your children uh, choose to sit down and study the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. May these things that we've learned this evening or this morning, as the case may be in, in America, um, may, may the Spirit remind us as the week goes by of, of those truths that you've taught us in this session and that to bring us to situations where we need to apply those truths to bring honor and glory to you. That's our desire, Father, to honor and glorify you in all that we think, say, and do. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. And we'll be on again coming Wednesday.